It's okay. Okay, everybody, welcome to my session about Windows 7 tuning using Wireshark. My name is Rolf Leuter. I'm running a small company over in Europe. We are doing mainly uh, Wireshark troubleshooting, network troubleshooting, and trainings. And I'm here at Sharkfest for the fifth time now, so uh, it's always a pleasure to come over here and meet a lot of specialists. When I was asking uh, Janice last time after the event, what are the most wanted topics of the Sharkfest? Is it, is it more theory? Is it practice? Or is it Wireshark knowledge? Uh, she said yes. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> And so uh, what I tried here is to combine the three topics into the one session. I used an, a real, a, an, a, an action case history from a, one of our customers uh, to make this session based on these uh, customer files. We will all learn about theory about the uh, TCP behavior. So we need the necessary background of TCP to understand what Wireshark is telling us. Wireshark can help us a lot in the TCP area. We are talking about the expert Wireshark. But we need to understand what is window scaling, what is retransmission, and what is uh, selective acknowledge. So it will be a, mix, a mixture between theory of TCP, uh, optimized Wireshark handling, and Finally, as a result, solving of an issue uh, of a customer. So let's start with some background facts. As soon as I get this under control here. Okay. <laughs> so the customer was a company based in Switzerland. Come on. <laughs> which was distributing software over a wide area over the night through remote offices in Asia in this time, in this situation. But the process did not finish until in the morning the offices started, reopened. So something was wrong with the throughput because the customer was paying for 45 meg bandwidth and he was calculating just over the thumb that he only was getting 2 megabit per second. So that's uh, where he called us and asked us to analyze. As we do a lot of training, we have a lot of uh, uh, customers which um, met us on a, on a seminar, and that's uh, when they come back to us. And they try first to solve the problem. That's, that's of course, the best. That uh, ends up that when we come in, normally the easy stuff is gone. They have found themselves. The other benefit is the costs don't play that role anymore because they have a problem which normally is there for some time and has to be solved. So when you look at these facts, you may suspect different components, of course. Does the provider not perform? Does it not deliver what uh, the customer is paying for? Is it the server? which is under, under control from, the, from, the, from our customer, or is it the client at the other end of performing? It could be all of this. And the finger pointing situation, you know it all, say normally point to the, net, to the network. So, so this is a situation which you can come in with your TCP knowledge and with your Wireshark. And TCP is so clever, and if you know it, how it works, you can solve all these situations. 100% because TCP gives you enough information and that's what we are going to look at here. Of course, the time is limited. Our, our standard uh, TCP class is three days, but uh, we will give you a lot of here. Okay. So when we talk about TCP, we must understand the history of this protocol. It's more than 30 years old. It was developed in the 70, beginning of 70s, finally put into operation beginning of 80s. It's 30 years in age, and it's still going strong. 
Can tell me any? Can you tell me anything else which is in our business 30 years and still there? So these guys have done an excellent job uh, in 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 uh, looking for the future. But still, they couldn't foresee certain things like the running out of uh, running out of the IP address and uh, things like this. And also, they couldn't foresee that we will have a gigabit bandwidth lines over the world, around the world. So the protocol initially was fine for, for bandwidth up to 10 megs, which was at that time really high, very high speed. But today we have gigs and 10 gigs and 40 gigs and so on. So we went into certain limits, not because TCP is designed bad, because it just, uh, they had to define some limits uh, for the fields, for the lengths of the fields and things like this. The problem is not really high bandwidth on its own. The problem is really a combination of high bandwidth and delay or delay. It's a product uh, between bandwidth and delay, that, which runs uh, uh, into where TCP runs into its limitation. But uh, there are remedies against this, which we are looking at in a minute. This is a term which is also known as elephants, long fat networks or long fat pipes, which is very common these days because you can have a gigabit link from, from, from Europe to, to the States for, for no problem. And that's what uh, makes uh, TCP under certain circumstances not performing very well. So let's see if in our case in our uh, real case, this was the situation. Before we start analyzing, here the promised theory which we have to understand. When we're talking about TCP, uh, I guess you heard about the window size, which is a very key parameter of each window size session, Windows uh, session, TCP, win, uh, TCP session. And what it stands for is that at the beginning in the TCP three-way handshake, every side is announcing its available receive buffer. It's very important. It's not the sending buffer, it's the receive buffer. So let's quickly look at our trace file here. It's actually the trace file which is based uh, uh, on, on this case. Uh, you see a window size on this TCP sync. That means uh, every side is announcing a window size in bytes the client as well as the server. And this means, actually it's a help uh, for the uh, technique called flow control. This prevents that one side ever, ever overflows the receiver of the other side. Because it, we're telling them, we were telling the other what uh, amount of data we are able to receive. And in addition to the initial uh, size at the, at the uh, synchronization step, we are repeating this value in each acknowledge. So when the window side shrinks in the acknowledge, this value is announced. So here you see that the client, and we can tell that this is the client always because by definition in a TCP, the client is building up a session. So this is a client here, the 130 is the client, and this seems to be the server. The client is telling the server, I'm offering you a window size of 8,000 for this specific session, 8 kilo. And the server itself is telling uh, here the same value, which must not be, it could be completely different. So this is the initial value, which is at the very beginning offered. The problem with this window size is it is limited to two bytes. If we go quickly back and look where this uh, value is located, we go into the TCP and if we go down to the window size, then we see the value is two bytes only. So the maximum value we can have is FF, which is 65,000 bytes. So there is no uh, there is no way to announce more than 65,000 bytes or uh, in binary 64K. 
That's the value which was initially designed in TCP, and without options, it cannot be increased. So let's assume these guys are using this value. The server in Europe has announced to the server in the States the full window. It must not be the full window, you just see that you can announce less, then, uh, then the situation is even worse. In this case, the server has announced the full window of 4064K. Uh, we have a 10 megabit speed line, 10 megabit per second, and 100 millisecond delay in one direction. So 200 round trips, which is actually a low fat pipe. And this value is not even very bad. You can have more if you go through satellite. So 100 millisecond is a reasonable value in delay. So let's assume this server starts now with a setting point 10 megabit a second, per second. You can easily calculate yourself uh, by sending 10 megabits per second, your 65k bytes are sent on the line within 55 milliseconds. The first packet hasn't even arrived yet in Europe. The line is full. The server must stop sending more bytes by definition because that's what the window size uh, is telling you. So what happens now, these packets are traveling through Europe, through, through Europe. And what a lot of people misunderstand, if you send with 10 or with more gigabit or one gigabit, the situation is the same because the traveling speed is the same independent from what uh, you're sending. If you're sending with one gig instead of one uh, of 10 meg, the packet is just closer together. And uh, the, the first packet will not arrive earlier uh, with a 10 gig. So it doesn't change, we cannot change the 10 millisecond. So what happens after the first two packets, you know delayed acknowledge maybe from the session from Han Sang, of the two of the receiving two packets, I start acknowledging, sorry, I start acknowledging and send back an acknowledge, but the acknowledge again needs 100 milliseconds to go back. So we have an idle time of about 150 milliseconds, right? Before we can send again. We have no way to solve this because we cannot change these parameters. You cannot change the delay. The delay is given. So uh, to solve this pro problem, they uh, added new parameters to TCP and one parameter uh, uh, is this window scaling which we are going to look at. So if this window scaling is not activated at the beginning of the session, you may have the effect that you never ever can use the bandwidth. So maybe this is one or is the reason for our, for our restrictions. Another option which we are going to look at, which has been implemented, is a selective knowledge. So uh, without this uh, option, we have the standard knowledge, and we will see the difference uh, in a minute. Timestamp, another option was introduced. It has to do with the larger windows. We often do uh, time around tick time measurements. This doesn't really help for analyzing actually only to keep in the end devices a more accurate round trip time. But these two are very helpful and they can improve the throughput significantly. So as you can see here, you can even have more delay if you go to satellites. We are talking about 400 to 500 milliseconds, which makes our situation even worse because you remember we have the bandwidth time delay product. So if you increase one of the parameter, then the situation becomes worse. So let's look at this window size parameter. What they invented is, they invented a, an option which is negotiable. Because you want to keep backwards compat compatibility to all installed TCP uh, stacks. So what actually is done at the beginning of the session, you can negotiate this option, that means this, the client is suggesting the option and it can either be accepted or refused by the server. Uh, only if both sides accepting these options then it's uh, used throughout this session, which makes sense and gives you a full backward compatibility. 
What it actually does is they are negotiating a multiplier that means the window, which is still only uh, for uh, two bytes, uh, is still the same, but you arrange telling the other, listen, if I announce you 100 bytes in that window, multiply this value by 4 or by 8 or by 16. So at the very beginning, we are telling the other what multiplier he should use, what multiplier he should use for my announcements. So it's kind of tricky I'm telling the other uh, how he should calculate my window size. Uh, the value which is actually sent over is so-called scaling factor uh, between 0 and 14, and it actually used as the S to the power of this factor. So if you say over I'm using a, multi, uh, a scaling factor of 2, then the actual multiplier will be 4. That means uh, I'm telling my opposite station to multiply my values by 4. So this gives you a, gives you a huge value because uh, value goes up to 14 to the power of 14 gives 16,000. 16,000 times the today 64K, the window sizes can go up to one gigabyte now, which is really good enough for uh, the lowest line uh, so far and the, 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 the biggest band. Of course, Announcing such a window means the receiver must have this memory per session, right? Because if I'm telling the other I have a window size of I have one gig, I must have this gig right, right in RAM. It's not fast enough to write to hard disk. The receive window is always part of the RAM. So, of course, I will not always announce more than needed but uh, it's possible, theoretically, to go up to this value. So here, in open example, one virus, one side was announcing the factor of 7, and 2 to the power of 7 uh, is uh, 128, that means uh, if in the main field, uh, 64 i is in, then you have to multiply by And let's go back to our uh, session here. And let's see if window scaling in our situation was turned on. Uh, you find it in the first three frames, as I mentioned, and you see it even up here. So you see our client is suggesting window scaling 256. So this is already calculated by Wireshark. This is actually the multiplier already. If you go inside, then the actual scaling value is 16. As you can see down here, 16 and uh, 2 to the power of 16, or vice versa, yes, 2 to the power of 16 gives 200 and where is it? 56, yes. Okay, the other uh, server is suggesting a uh, value of. Calculated value is 16, and the actual value you can be found here in the options. If you open the options, you will see then these values here individual. So window scaling obviously was turned on here, and we will see later on where in the Windows uh, device you can turn it on or off if it's not. So let's go back to our other options here, or, or to, or to our example, which we just had with this link from uh, USA to Europe. Let's assume, let's look at, again at this value without scaling. So here is the time in milliseconds, and here is the, the byte sent in a K a kilo. So uh, remember, we have a window size of 64K. The green line is the so called window size announced by the client. The red line are the data sent by the server. 
So what you can see that within 50 milliseconds, we are already at our 64K. But we know that the data must now arrive uh, at Europe. So the first packet, which was sent here, of 100 milliseconds arrives at Europe. Europe. Then the Europe sends it back and acknowledges, but again, it arrives only at 200 uh, milliseconds back in the USA. So after 200 milliseconds, the window will be opened again, because in the acknowledges, it says, yes, uh, you can send me two more planes. So the window size is open here, but only up to the maximum value, and then again, the same uh, idle time. So in this example, we can have, out of the 10 megabit line, we actually can achieve a maximum throughput of 2.5 meg. There is no way around it, because uh, we have no scaling. So here you can calculate what you do with this, uh, if you have the window size and the round trip time, it's a very easy formula, which in this case gives 2.5 megabit. What is your guess? What scaling factor we would need here to solve this problem to really be able to use the 10 megabits? Four, yes, four is a guess. So we should start at 256, right? So the scaling factor actually will be two, because the other then two to the power of two multiplied. So I'll tell you other window scaling equals to two, which means if I will like my values by four. That's exactly right. Let's see what happens now. We start with the window size of 256. We start sending, again, these reverse frames of traveling over it after 100 milliseconds arriving. The acknowledges are released, are coming back after 200 milliseconds. We are uh, receiving the first acknowledges. And these acknowledges are now opening the window size just smooth. So four is the minimum, right? If you want to have four, it's even better. But this means the second now can use the full bandwidth, even so it's filling the window here, but filling the window is limited. You can fill, that's what that's what a window is for. You can use the window, uh, you can up, you can go up to the window size, never go behind or above the window size. Uh, you would send packets which the, the receiver would uh, not be able to process. So here is the formula to calculate the window size uh, the factor. It's 10 megabit your bandwidth times your delay divided by 500 uh, kilobits as the uh, uh, standard window value. It's on 64k bytes, just calculating the bits. In this case, it's the factor of now you think, uh, it seems that uh, it's only a wide area problem with 200 milliseconds. That's wrong. Just uh, look at this in your local area. You may not have 200 milliseconds, but you may have instead of 10 meg, you may have 100 meg or gig. If you, can, if you, if you uh, multiply this by 10, in 100 meg, in, uh, at 100 meg, uh, the same effect arises at 20 milliseconds delay. If you have a giga, it always it already happens at 2 milliseconds delay, which is a value which you easily can achieve uh, within a building, right? If you go up to 10, then this already starts with 0, 2 milliseconds delay. So that's really important to understand. It's a product of delay and bandwidth, and you should really care that these scaling factors are okay and they are turned on correctly. Uh, that's what we are going um, to verify. So uh, Wireshark is helping you here in a uh, clever way. It is listening to the negotiation process. Here uh, we start with an unscaled window because at the very first frame we are not allowed to use scaling. We do not know if the uh, other side is uh, uh, supporting this option. So here the value is unscaled. We are suggesting a scaling value, but we have to wait for the other side 
to confirm. If the window scaling parameter is not present at all, this means the other side does not support window scaling and then we do not use it. In this case, we get a confirmation window scaling. And that means well, we can use window scaling from the third frame on. And from the third frame on already, window scaling is used and Wireshark now also changes the calculation. You can see here 66, 640 can only be achieved with window scaling, otherwise the maximum value would be 65. So this is already a scale window uh, that's uh, very, very, really nicely done. Once you have a session, once you have a session and you miss the three-way handshake at the beginning, then you miss the scaling value. There's no way to, to learn it anymore during the session because it's only uh, uh, these values are only seen at the very beginning. Okay, we will see what happens then. Uh, you may see that the packets will go beyond the window size which uh, is on the chart which we are going to look at. Okay, the sessions, I mentioned the sessions itself are negotiated during the, during the sync parameterization process. Here is just another uh, screenshot of what you can see. Another option which may improve your throughput is the selective acknowledge option. When you have visited Hansang's uh, first session of today, you remember that uh, if uh, the sender is sending 10 frames to the receiver and frame number 6 is lost, then the, uh, the, the receiver will send an acknowledge pointing to the next expected frame. So it's not acknowledging the last receive, it's pointing to the, the frame number 6. Please send the frame number 6. What the sender cannot know at this point is whether 7 or 8 or 9 has arrived. Because with the sender acknowledge, you just can say what's the next I want. So the sender was sending 10 frames, frame number 6 was lost, and acknowledge coming back says, please send me number 6. What the server then does, as he does not know if 7, 8, or 10 has arrived, the server sends just frame number six and waits for the acknowledge. If the acknowledge coming back now points to eleven, then it assumes, it can assume that seven, eight, nine, and ten was received or okay. If the next acknowledge points to seven, then the server will be seven. So the server in the standard acknowledge process must listen to the acknowledge numbers of the client, which is okay. But remember, if we have a round trip time of 200 milliseconds, we are idling all the time, right? Frame, the server is sending frame number six, awaiting 200 milliseconds for the acknowledger to react. So with frame loss in your network, in one area, quite frequently have frame loss. You always have break times, idle times, where your bandwidth is just lost. And this is solved this has been solved with a selective acknowledge option. So again, an option which you should care that it is uh, uh, activated at the beginning of the session, and that's how it works. We don't have the time to go into all the details here. It's out of the trace file, but I give you enough information. So here the sender has sent two frames, and you know that the sequence numbers or increased by bytes. And uh, the last byte in this two uh, of the second frame was 2620. So the acknowledge coming back normally or always points to the next expected. So it doesn't say I have received 2620, it says send me 2621. So it points to the next expected bytes. But the next packet which is arriving does not contain this number. It contains 5,241. So here are at least two packets missing. So what a normal, non-selective acknowledge would do, it just would repeat this packet here. 
That's what we call to acknowledge, right? But within the package, we just tell please send me what you see from the one. So we pray, well, tell me that we have received the package. We have selling the knowledge that is different. We are still pointing to the next expected package. But within the selling of knowledge, we have fields to tell the server, listen, I have received this and this block. And it even uh, can contain more than one block, which you can see here. We have another gap here, and I received another. So this technology, it still, it still points to initial missing gap, but it at the same time indicates, but I have received two blocks, so you can send me this missing gap. And now what's happened is the following, and this is what really speeds up the thing. The server can now send more than one packet. We actually could fill all this gap in one row, and at the same time, just continue with the next packet. So we don't have this additional delay for a month. So this, uh, again, this is especially uh, efficient if you have uh, long delays, uh, because these delays cause idling the time. We always have these three suspects in a, in a troubleshooting situation. I always try to break it down into these three suspects. And this is where normally the finger pointing uh, situation gets stuck. Uh, they don't point, they normally don't point to each other, they all point on the network, right? So you have to prove that it is not the network. That I just you don't have you don't have to give the solution in every case. In, in most cases with my customer, it's enough if I tell if I can tell him look on the client or the network on the server. This would help to move or to unlock a, a certain situation. And I can promise you with TCP you can do this in hundred percent of the situation. If you have a you have a trace. Uh, looking at, you can say where the problem is. What can a client do? A client can walk or slow down a TCP transfer by announcing a small window to a small window. Because remember, the window is the floor control. If I announce a 5 kilo window only to the server, he will never send me more than 5 kilo and wait for the technology. So the client can slow, slow down the, a, a session as well as the server. The server, for example, may not be able to deliver fast enough. Maybe it's all about the developed process. So the hard disk or access over there. What can the network do? Of course, the network can draw flames. That's the, probably the most frequent situation which may happen. So where is our problem here? And with TCP, you can find out who is doing what. So that's what I'm going to show you uh, 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 right here. What, X, what Wireshark does for us, Wireshark not only shows you all, shows us all the packets in a very detailed uh, solution, solution uh, Wireshark can do more. It has a so called expert system. What is the difference? The difference is a normal normalizer treats all the packets and we pass in reloads. He's not able to make the relation between the packets. He's not able to tell that frame number 25 is an answer to 22. An expert system can do this. And Wireshark has an expert system for TCP, a very clever one. It can detect all these situations for you without uh, making you to go through all these calculus which you would have to do uh, to find out if the second is lost. The second is lost, very easy. Every second has a number, right? If they don't match, right, Sean comes out, second is lost. That's a one. So it's pure mathematics, but it has to be done. So why Sean can tell you in different severities, from chats, notes, to warnings, to errors, what's going on. And this is a good advice. But it doesn't help, it doesn't replace your knowledge. You still need to know whether TCP window size zero is a good thing or a bad thing, right? 
and it will tell you fast read translation and everything, but it's uh, up to you to judge, and we will look at this in a minute. The expert, by the way, is hidden behind this button here in the lower left corner. You ever looked at this button? You ever looked at this one? Okay. It changes color. So during the capturing of data, Wireshark online, online uh, reads all through the session. You can have hundreds of parallel sessions. It reads through all the sessions. If one, in one TCP session, something is wrong, this button here changes the color. From gray, the non expert, if you don't have TCP, for example, you need me. There's nothing to expert, there's no sequence number, nothing. If from checks, if you, if it, if the uh, Wireshark sees uh, information like uh, OK, HTTP OK messages, sync frames, uh, do this. Uh, uh, turk, uh, yellow and red, it changes the color. If you press on that button, it comes up with the screen I just showed you before. And, but again, the number of these error messages is not necessarily an indication whether uh, a line is good or not. It can be even a situation where everything seems to be okay, but the throughput still is not good. Because, um, uh, a small window size announced by the client. This isn't bad, right? This is legal. It's not optimized, but it's legal. So we will not see an error here uh, because it's not forbidden to announce a small window size. So I always use this as a as a first indication. This button look through the look through the messages, and after a certain time, of course, you get used to. Uh, jump on certain messages. Zero window, for example, is one which is not really uh, very uh, beneficial. So, and but there is another very strong option which I would like to show you, and that's the graphic, uh, this graphical presentation of a TCP session. This is really strong, and I can tell you that's the third thing I use. Sometimes a graphic tells us more than a thousand frames. It's no need to. Look through thousands or hundreds of thousands of frames. You can open with a mouse click, you can open a TCP graph which gives you all the relevant parameters. It's incredible, but that's what you all can read out of this graph. And that's what I would like to show you in the last the remaining time because this is really very, very helpful. And, uh, Let's start with this graph here, and I'll show you after in a minute how you gain it. It's in, it's in it's under statistics. Uh, in the graph, we have again the two scales you already know. We have the time spent in the horizontal, and we have the bytes transferred in the vertical. That's very easy because uh, if you just listen, uh, list the sequence number, then you have the bytes. Because the sequence number in the TCP frames is only increased if bytes are transferred. For example, if you have a knowledge, the sequence of those numbers always stays the same. So if the sequence number is increased from the frame to the next, that's the amount of bytes which have left in the packet. This allows you also to locate uh, or position a frame in this chart because you just look at the start sequence number of the frame and position it according to this scale and you have the time and that's where you position it. I'll show you this in a minute. But we have two more lines here which makes it very, uh, which, which are very important. We have a blue line here, it's hard to see, which are the acknowledges. And we have the window size from the client. So it's very important that you look at the direction of this chart. Every session has two charts. We are talking about TCP half sessions. We are not talking about TCP, there are actually two independent half sessions. The sequence numbers are not synchronized in both directions, they are only uh, counting bytes in one direction. 
So when you select this plot, I'll show you in a minute, you must have the right direction, the direction uh, where the data has been sent. Sometimes data flow in both directions, and you have to look at both uh, sides. In our case, we only have one direction. So this is the direction from the server to the client who may see the IP address appear uh, or listed. So actually, the blue lines are values which Wireshark reads out of the acknowledges. In the acknowledges, we have a counter, and when the counter goes up, it makes a vertical line. And in the acknowledge itself, we have a value for the window size, 46K. So what it actually does, it just draws the upper line uh, according to the window size in the acknowledge. So what you see here is, when I come back and zoom in later, but let's look at this overhead. For example, what you see here is what uh, we already heard in the earlier session, but it's in a graphical presentation. It's called slow start. So you basically can see here through these red black bars, these are frames sent by the server. So what you see here is that the server is not filling the window immediately. We actually know. He could sign up to here, but that's not what he does. That's slow start. Uh, start sending uh, an amount of packet, then it waits for the acknowledge. You see here, this a vertical blue acknowledge this frames, and then it increases the size. You see this? So it's really nice to see if you want to see this with frames, you have a hard job to find out. And then finally, it fills up the window. You see this? So here it fills up the window, so you cannot scale anymore because increase anymore because the window size is not increased. But then suddenly the client increases the window, which is possible, you see here. So I really recommend, if you want to understand TCP, use this graph, work to it. You also can see the delay. The delay is, the boundary time is the time between the frame set and the knowledge. And this time it's about uh, 200 millisecond, 180 millisecond and coming back to this chart in a minute. So it's really a lot you can see. You even can see lost frames, and that's what I uh, would like to show here you in the live trace. So let's open this trace file and search for this chart. And so what I do first, I have to select the right direction, I told you. I can tell you that in our trace files, the data are coming from the server. So I select frame number two for the chart to make it faster. And I go to statistics up here. And I go to IO, not IO graph, sorry. That's not a nice feature. I go to TCP stream graph and I select the time sequence graph TCP trace. And what it actually does, it builds up a screen with our TCP session. We see the time bar here. We are talking here about seconds. We see vertical packets. And now let's zoom into this individual packet. And you can go down to a level where you even see the, the size of the packets, how big the packets are. You can see this here. Oh. Just a little bit too much. Let's go back here. Can you see these limitations here? So these are individual packets sent out in a burst from the server. And here you see the acknowledges on the right line and here the window size. So what we see here is that the server has slow start. See here this area here. It goes up quite fast and then for whatever reason throttles down. And we have to find out why the server is not continuing here like this. It would be finished within seconds, but it throttles down or something throttles down here for this uh, uh, value. If you look a little bit more into it, we may find the reason. So we see again here the slow start. We see the window size. 
What would you say? Is the window size good enough? Yes. What device can we exclude if the window size is okay? Which of the devices of the three? The client, yes. That means, in our case, the address over here, the receiver. So we can exclude this because the blue line here is wide open. The server could go up. At the very beginning, it was a restriction. So it's before, but then the client reopened it wide open. Uh, so the client obviously is not the cause here of our restriction. So let's exclude the, the, the client here from our list. By the way, looking at this trace file, you find some other very interesting facts. For example, the round trip delay. Round trip delay is something which you always can find out at the very beginning because the TCP session here uh, is end to end. So when you see a frame coming back, then this must be the round trip at the very beginning. The advantage at the sync at this uh, phase of the session is that the application is not yet involved uh, in the process. So uh, we can assume that the TCP sync request to a server is responded within microseconds because it's only the TCP stack involved on our target. So we can assume the time between our request and our and the receiving response as round trip time. And here you can see our round trip time is 186 milliseconds. That's, as I mentioned, a normal value if you leave the continents 200 milliseconds. Another small thing which uh, you can say by using this is that uh, you can say on which side this trace has been made, whether on the uh, client side or on the server side. That's kind of nice because uh, you know, you can find out that, for example, this uh, trace file here was made on the, ser on the server side. The first request came from the client was immediately replied within three microseconds and then sent to the client, sent back to the client and 168 milliseconds later it came back. Uh, if it would have been made on the client side, then the 186 would be between 22 and uh, two and one and not three and one. Make a drawing of this and you'll find out it's really nice that uh, you can tell Sometimes you get trace files which you didn't make yourself, made yourself, then this is an important information. So it's also an important information if we are losing frame, because if we are measuring the fire shot from the center side, which sends packet to the client, we will not see lost frame, right? Because at our end, the frames were still there. So that's very important, but we will still be able to recognize because the acknowledges coming back from the client will tell us. And that's exactly the case here in our chart. We have lost frames here, but we see the original frames and that's sometimes a little bit confusing to people. Let's zoom down a little bit here until we see the individual frames. And here you see an individual frame which is uh, transmitted after these frames here. So this is a so-called retransmission. Why? Because it actually has been retransmitted already. Let's zoom out a little bit and if you press the space bar you can even turn on a crosshair which is hard to see here but I try my best. So you see that this frame here was originally uh, really sent. On the client side we would see a gap here. But as we have recorded this on the server side where the frames were originated, we will see the original frame. But we can assume that it did not arrive because if the acknowledge does not go up, 
means the client has not received this packet, or if the packet had an FCS error or whatever. So don't really uh, rely on what you see here, rely on what the client is acknowledging or not. And the client uh, would acknowledge the frame if it has received it correctly. So it's serious, right? It just doesn't make this just for fun. So uh, if we go out here, we see that we have lost frames on our network. Our network is dropping frames. So we exclude, we just excluded the client from our list, but the network and the server are still in the game. And we see here retransmitted frame from our server, which means our network is dropping frame. Now the question, shall we blame the network for our problem? Let's go back quickly to our chart. Uh, I made here just a rough throughput calculation uh, just by uh, uh, looking at the elevation of this uh, chart. You see that the server initially started with about 15 negative per second, and then for some reason it dropped down to 1.5, and that's exactly what the customer has realized. Uh, the customer was calculating with the bandwidth available and found out something must be wrong. But now, again, back to what is the reason for this. We can exclude the network because the, the number of lost frames we are seeing here is acceptable. What is acceptable? That's always a depends question, right? But uh, TCP can handle lost frames. That's what it's built for. You can handle up to 10% or 20% of frames. It just gets slower, right? But we are far away of having 10% of lost frames. We have some radically lost frames here. So the network, each network can lose frames. So we, have, we can exclude the network here in our case. So what's left is the server. But why? The server obviously starts with a 15 megabits and then for some reason drops down to 1.5 and it's not trying to speed up again. And that's exactly where the last point comes into the game. That's the Windows stack or whatever stack you are using. And we are looking at this Windows stack here and I just want to give you the information. There are a lot of TCP parameters in there and we will, can, we will not be able to cover it all. Otherwise we will end in a Windows a class here, but just that you are aware that the server can limit our uh, transmission as well as all the other components uh, can also do. Uh, when uh, Windows Vista was introduced, the TCP stack was fully redesigned from Microsoft. And the same stack is present in Windows 7 and in Server 2. So these are the actual stacks. And actually, they invented a lot of nice options. They, uh, they invented auto-tuning, which should adapt to many situations. But, but as you already know, uh, auto-tuning always automatic features, they may work, but they must not work. They may have the situations where manually tuning could achieve a better result. Here are the commands, net shell interface TCP show globals, and you uh, just get a part of this uh, uh, list here, Jimmy offloading, receive stacks waiting, uh, uh, receive stacks late, scaling, and so on. RFC 1324, by the way, uh, these are the options with uh, scaling and so on. So I'm just telling you, you should have a look at these options once you have find out that the options are not activated, for example, the scaling options, go to the internet, there's plenty of information that it also tells you how to change, which uh, is too much here in this class. But finally, what was it in our situation? What did help uh, in our situation? So here are some options. 
chimney of chlorine that leads to new uh, segmentation of the adaptive layer, things like this, auto tuning. In our situation, it was a command, uh, an option, window scaling heuristics. We had to disable window scaling heuristics. What actually was it? Heuristics means when the servers, in this case, when the server keeps losing frame, at, and let's go back to the chart and then we can actually see what's happening here. Let's go back to this chart and look at this point here, what actually happens here, why does the server throttle down. I zoom in again here and you see that we are continuously losing packets. Uh, I just zoom in at one point here. You see here these retransmitted packets? So we are still losing packets. Our network is still losing packets. Now, the heuristic value in Windows TCP stack tells after a certain amount of lost packet, throttle down your window uh, size, throttle down your send packet to a small amount so that no lost frames are occurring. And that's exactly what happens here. It throttles down to a value where no packets are lost. This may be a nice option, but a nice feature, but in our situation it throttles down the whole process significantly. So everybody agrees that this would be much better even with the transmitted packet, right? So the auto-tuning feature here was really not adequate. It's, it's, it's not optimal, optimizing. It's slowing down. So we rather take here some percent of lost packet, but decide to uh, keep on with our window size uh, fully used. And that's exactly what happened after turning off this parameter. Uh, Look at here, that's the trace file with the parameter I turned off. The same trace file, exactly the same file, SMB reserve message block. Here I can show you the file also on the, on the Wireshark. And we will still have lost packets. We cannot solve this situation of the lost packet. But we told the sender not to react on this dropped packet. Just go on, keep filling the window and go on with retransmitting and we accept that a certain amount of packets must be retransmitted. But we have much better throughput. You see here, if I turn on my crosshair again, the whole process is finished in about a two and a half second. And we still have lost packets, I can quickly show you if I go in here, but the window size is not taken back by the, you see here, we still have lost packets, but the window size is not taken back. So in this case, absolutely clear after all who was the limiting factor and uh, after tuning this and adjusting the right values, uh, the throughput was, as I could see here, 24 megabits uh, per second instead of the roughly 2 megabits the customer initially. I calculate. Okay, any question? If you liked it, I have another session uh, about uh, wireless roaming problem analysis. It's the same uh, situation. I will show you uh, a real case uh, from a customer and again we'll provide you with necessary theory. We'll try and show you how Wireshark uh, can solve it and at the end, I will uh, tell you what was the solution.
So thank you very much for your attention. Have a nice evening.